A lot of news this week. Most of it not good, as news Mm. tends to be. But here's something that I learned this week, Alyssa. Did you know that America is the world's leading producer of experts? Top export. (laughs) We export our experts. It's true. We've got amber waves of both grain and people who suddenly know everything there is to know about complicated news topics that require years of study to understand. Like, remember last year, everyone became an epidemiologist? Yes. Just really oh. quick. I just, on Facebook. <laughs> on Facebook. And um, there was a period of time where a lot of people were um, experts on the state of Georgia, which I found really interesting. Right. I forgot about that. Jeez. Climate change. A lot of people are experts on climate change, uh, depending on what news story is happening. Now, um, I've just noticed a ton of Afghanistan experts. Geopolitical experts who only weeks ago were explaining recombinant DNA and other things. Yeah, it's it's truly a miracle. And we are a country of gentlemen scholars. Um, Okay, so I'm laying it on kind of thick right now, but this week, you know, as we've discussed over text, as the Taliban took Afghanistan uh, like it was a basket of free zucchini in a teacher's lounge, I watched it from far away. Like almost all Americans watched it from far away. Same here. Same here. And I personally found all the pontificating about what happened and why to kind of reek of bullshit. So, Alyssa, you have actually been to Afghanistan um, mm-hmm. And you've actually participated in in strategic talks on Afghanistan. How do people tell the difference between useful information on what's going on over there and bullshit that they can just ignore? So here's the thing, Aaron. As someone who has been to Afghanistan a couple times, even I am like, I'm not like... No one should listen to me. This has always been my thing. I did a I did a talk a couple of years ago at a fancy Ivy League school and some uh it was a woman asked me, "Uh can you explain the president's approach to uh Iraq and Afghanistan and, and it why his position in Iran da 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 da." And I was like, "Girl, you get 5 minutes with me and this is what you're asking. I'm not answering your question because I am not an expert." And so I think that I wish everyone was just delightfully self-aware as I am, uh, but they're not. And so we have seen so many hot takes on Twitter. We have seen pundits, okay, flash, news flash. Pundits aren't experts. And I wish that news anchors in an effort to fill time on their shows, didn't treat pundits as experts in Middle East policy. And here's my view. Right now, uh, the people I am listening to are the people who are there. Clarissa Ward on CNN is someone who, when I'm really trying to understand, everyone's got a spin, right? We've come to this point in our lives where it's really hard to get information that doesn't have some sort of like political spin. And I don't want that about this. This is this is, uh, this is is about a nation of people uh, that we should care about. And I guess I just don't want like pundits' opinions when – they literally didn't even Google the subject matter before they got on. So for me, I am really just listening to people who have been doing this all their lives and are sort of, you know, experts in the region. I've listened to Richard Engel, Clarissa Ward. There are other people. But in the same way that I appreciate when anchors were telling us about COVID, it's like I'll really just wait for Anthony Fauci or Dr. Lena Wen, or Dr. Dara Cass, or Dr. Esther Chu. Uh, I am, I'm, I'm an expert. I'm an expert uh, focused lady. I think on matters like this. Mm-hmm. One thing that kind of is, it feels like a, an unwinnable, like Kafka esque rhetorical hellscape, is the fact that I think that the people that understand that our access to information is very limited, despite the the efforts of people like Clarissa Ward and Richard Engel and other people, right. Afghan journalists who are on the ground there, we have very limited access to information. And the people that understand that and that understand that sometimes it's best to say less or take a beat and wait to understand things before spouting an opinion, uh, those people have the wisdom to step out of conversations. But the people right. that don't understand that they should shut the fuck up continue to talk. And so conversations in moments like this become 
dominated by people who don't understand that they should lean out at this moment. All the way out. Just lean, lean all the way out. Also, I have noticed a lot of, you know, a lot of Republicans being booked, right? There's just, I just feel like right now we're just getting such fucking garbage in our in our brains from these people. But there are Republicans who are so quick to criticize Joe Biden Yet they're forgetting that Donald Trump's the one who signed the treaty. Donald Trump did this. The Taliban was supposed to, you know, disavow al-Qaeda. They haven't done that. And so it's like, I, it's all just so not on the fucking level, you know? And it's just mm-hmm. too important. I feel like this and COVID are just two things that are too important to not be on the level about. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that it it is... Like you mentioned, that it's hard to find opinions that don't have an agenda behind them right now. And I really struggle with the fact that it's hard to find an analyst or somebody who isn't a reporter but who can provide context, who right. isn't going to give me a full picture of the four by 100 meter relay of fuck ups that was totally. everything that led. Because George W. Bush fucked up, Barack mm-hmm. Obama fucked up, you know. Donald Trump fucked up, and now there is fucking up happening on Biden's watch. And I just would really love to have people engage honestly, even even if we don't have like all of the information. I think that like the only way to prevent this big of a fuck up again is like an honest engagement with what was a fuck up without without believing that acknowledging mistakes is akin to being weak. I couldn't agree more. It's like there's enough blame to go around here. And, you know, there's so much conflation of issues. Like saying that to the rest of the to, – to, to the layman, it seems like the Biden administration didn't have a plan to get out is not the same as saying we shouldn't have gotten out. Like those two things are not the same. And I feel like anyone who is, it's so disingenuous when you're trying to make that point and people are like, well, what, you should? we should have stayed for another five years, another 20 years. It's like, no, you fucking asshole, shut the fuck up. I'm just saying mm-hmm. that when you take out 2,500 troops and have to send back 6,000, it seems like something went awry. And we're just curious what happened. <laughs> Right, exactly. And then in the middle of the these conversations, what's getting lost is the humanity of the people of Afghanistan that are going to suffer, namely uh, women and girls, most likely. Right. Like the totally. Taliban hasn't done ha- as as of yet. We don't know uh, what they're doing if they've hurt anybody. You know, we right. don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We haven't heard any news, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. We know how they treated women and girls in the 90s. And we know that there are people that worked for and alongside the U.S. military in Afghanistan that are stuck there right now that who have live their lives are in danger because yep. of like bureaucratic backlogs of paperwork. And um, I just, I find that the, the rush to point fingers and assign blame versus understanding the complexity of the situation, which are two different and things. And solving the problem. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, but those that kind of like, I don't know, blame dick measuring contest, everyone saying they were the ones who were correct. It's like, who fucking cares? People's lives are on the line and uh, we lose the people in trying to preserve egos and to preserve yeah. like the the rightness and and to Monday morning quarterback it. Look, this is a kind of strange conversation for us to have on a podcast about the news, but this is just the way that you and I have both interacted with this story it has been yeah. like I felt terrible and helpless watching the images coming out of Afghanistan. I also feel terrible and helpless watching people having like a dumb, you know, slap fight about whose fault this is. Like I, I right. just I, I would really love for us to open our doors to people in Afghanistan who we created a an untenable situation for them and then just abandoned them. I would love to be able to welcome more of them to this country. And I don't know what needs to happen in order for that to work out. No, but you know, this is this is these are the questions I hope that we will get answers to soon when everyone mm-hmm. stops being like, it's your fault. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it's like not the people who are suffering's fault, which is usually the way it fucking goes. Yeah. I just, I think you and I both just uh, advise a little bit of patience, uh, literacy, media literacy and understanding yeah. around this topic. And um, I'm grateful for all the people who haven't declared themselves Afghanistan experts this week. Um, Cause I'm certainly not. 
I need more information in order to formulate an opinion. And that is a that is a punditry sin, but that's how I feel about this. Here's something I don't need more information on to form an opinion about. <laughs> <laughs> like that segue? That was fucking brilliant. Thank you. It's a Greg Abbott, Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who tested positive for COVID. He's asymptomatic, uh, but nonetheless is received, and he's vaccinated. And he's nonetheless mm-hmm. receiving monoclonal antibody treatment, which has also not been approved by the FDA. You know, whatever. Let's. Uh, are we wasting a monoclonal antibody treatment on the governor of Texas? Is he really that important? Are the people he was at the maskless event with also getting such treatment? And are they all getting tested? And are they doing contact tracing? And. Uh, Aaron, he's exhausting. The state of Texas is so exhausting. Sorry, Texans. I love you, but your government, you're, it's a bitch who can't govern. <laughs> yeah, he is among the bitches least able to govern. He's When I saw that he was positive for COVID, my first thought was like, yeah, he fucked around and found out. And right. uh, and like as callous as it makes me feel, like we've discussed on this show recently, when I read about like a right wing radio host fucking around and finding out, I kind of don't have any sympathy left for people who have been spreading COVID misinformation. It's not because you know what, Aaron? Here's the thing is that this isn't going to be a moment of self-reflection for him, right? This is not going to be like he's not sitting in the governor's mansion right now getting his Regeneron, whatever the fuck it is he's getting, and saying, you know what? I am a fortunate person and I had the vaccine. I got a breakthrough case. I'm like prophylactically, I guess, getting this Regeneron. And you know what? I give a shit about all those kids going back to school and making sure, because we won't have enough Regeneron for them. I don't even know if kids can fucking get it, but you know my point. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that I use every every uh, bit of power I have to make sure that these kids can go back to school safely. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's having that moment of reflection. He's just like fucking sitting in the governor's mansion, getting his, you know antibody treatment being like yeah fucking no masks anywhere yeah i mean the thing is that the hardest people to teach a lesson to are stupid assholes and unfortunately stupid assholes are the ones that most need to learn their lesson and it Mm -hmm. seems like you know i um i sometimes read this this subreddit called leopards ate my face (laughs) it is uh it is I think that, that, well, the name of it is based on that tweet that went viral uh, right after the 2016 election, where it said, I never thought the leopards would eat my face, says the lady who voted for the leopards eating face party. (laughs) It's basically about people who advocated for uh, specific policies or voted for specific candidates having bad outcomes in their own lives as a result of their political actions. And that that forum is just wall to wall people who spread anti-vax misinformation being hospitalized with COVID. It is almost overwhelming. Um, There are so many right-wing radio hosts that have gotten it and are now on ventilators. A Catholic church official who had said that nobody should take the vaccine because they used fuel lines to develop it, now on a ventilator. Nobody is capable of learning their lesson. You know, right now, uh, Florida, Louisiana, Hawaii, Oregon, and Mississippi all uh, broke records for their seven-day averages of new COVID cases on Sunday. Louisiana has 126 cases per 100,000 individuals as of Sunday, which is more than three times the national average. They're out of like ICU beds in Mississippi and Alabama. They're almost out in Texas. People who have regular ass emergencies can't get into the emergency room because COVID patients are sucking up resources. And I kind of think like Greg Abbott is one of the, the chief architects of this. And he'll go down in history as as one of the worst offenders in proliferating what is happening right now. I mean, I guess that's the only solace I have is like his legacy is going to be a plague rat, essentially. He and his his bro, Ron DeSantis, are like the king plague rats. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any toast and roast this week? Let's move on to something a little bit more fun. I think there's just like one kind of like super groovy, upbeat toast. Oh, okay. Let's get into it. Okay. Aaron, 
Did you see a tweet yesterday that gave you like any level of joy? Yes, I did. And I think we saw the same tweet. And what was that tweet? That was a tweet from uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete, Secretary Pete now, right? Secretary Pete. Um, Secretary Pete tweeted, for some time, Chastin and I have wanted to grow our family. We're overjoyed to share that we've become parents. The process isn't done yet, and we're thankful for the love, support, and respect for our privacy that has been offered to us. We can't wait to share more soon. They're adopting. That's It is so, like... My heart was warm. I mean, I just like, I can't wait to see baby Bjorns on those two. Oh, yes, absolutely. That is going to be adorable. And I hope that uh, when the ba- when their baby is here, when their child is here, um, they're comfortable sharing some of that joy publicly because I think the public would really could use a little bit of joy. And you know what? This kid is so lucky because everyone has now learned how to say Buttigieg. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that kid is not. Oh, they've have a paved the all. way. Baby boot edge edge. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I didn't think about that. Um, but I can't, I can't wait to learn more about their little family. They seem great and happy, and they're both going to be great dads. Totally. Today, we are excited to chat with Don Hucklebridge, director of Paid Leave for All, which is an organization whose purpose is getting American workers a sustainable paid leave policy. Seems like it shouldn't be complicated, but it has been. Did you know that the only countries in the world without a paid leave policy are the U.S. and Papua New Guinea? That seems bad. Uh, Dawn, by the way, has degrees from the London School of Economics and Northwestern University. Heard of both of them. Dawn, welcome to Hysteria. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Uh, For our listeners who aren't already familiar with you and Paid Leave for All, can you tell us a little bit about what you do as director and what the mission of PLFA is? Absolutely. So yes, uh, Paid Leave for All is a national campaign of now more than 25 organizations uh, leading the fight for paid family and medical leave for every working person in this country. So I have the great honor of trying to sort of shepherd all of these organizations, come up with a strategy that aligns our resources, our assets, make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes, that in this critical moment where we think we can finally get this law passed, that we're bringing all of our, our strengths to bear and that we're working in concert and hopefully soon getting it done. What was paid family leave for all hoping to see in Biden's infrastructure bill? And how do you feel about the bill in its current form? What's interesting to say is that you hear a lot of this like, this is infrastructure, this is infrastructure. Okay, we can argue over sort of semantics. But what's important to know is that care policies like paid leave are just as important for enabling people to work as roads and bridges. And also something that's interesting is that I am fully in support of hard infrastructure and and my dad's an engineer. I know how important these things are. But 90% of jobs from hard infrastructure will go to men. And we've just lived through a crisis that has had a unique and disproportionate impact on women and caregivers, particularly women of color. So there is really no recovery. There is no long-term growth. There is no remaining a competitive force in this world. If we don't finally catch up and pass some of these economic policies that the rest of the world has. So um, would have loved to have seen paid leave and other policies in this one bipartisan bill. But I think the important thing is we have it in the budget resolution. There's a commitment from the White House, a proposal in Congress, and a commitment from the Speaker that infrastructure, the, the bipartisan bill, and the budget resolution must pass together. And so that's that's what we're fighting for, and we think it will happen before the end of the year. People talk a lot about leave for parents, but can you talk about what's in the bill for people who don't have kids, ask the woman without kids? <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. That's what you hear the most about, right, is moms and babies. And that's, I'm a mom, I have a baby, it's important. But this pandemic also showed us that any one of us, or I should say it reminded us, is one diagnosis away from a crisis. Any one of us can get injured. All of our parents will get ill and and age. You know, there's going to be unforeseen transitions, both you know, joyful and heartbreaking throughout each of our lives. And each of us is going to need to give and receive care. So this is a common sense policy that we should have had years ago. And I think, um, you know, COVID just put it under this big magnifying glass of what a failure this has been and how overdue this policy is. 
So this is a super popular policy, obviously. Why do you think there remains opposition to this seemingly nonpartisan issue? It's an issue that your organization refers to as like a super majority issue. Um, very few people will actually get behind a microphone and stand against this, yet there are certainly people trying to keep things the way they are. So what special interests oppose paid leave and what members of Congress have led the fight uh, for families on this issue? So there's a long history. We have so many great sort of champions who've, who've been behind this issue for years. The co-sponsors of the Family Act, of course, Congressman Rosa DeLauro, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, um, Patty Murray, and then all kinds of New York champions who've jumped in. Like the leaders, um, both Schumer and Speaker Pelosi are totally behind this. Uh, Ron Wyden in Oregon, um, Ayanna Presley. I mean, this is something that truly everyone should be able to get behind. Uh, I think in the past, there's been some opposition because of the idea of raising taxes. One important thing to note is that the proposal on the table right now actually does not raise taxes on anyone. You know, Biden's made this tax pledge. Anyone making under $400,000 isn't going to pay a penny more. So this is something that will be funded by the federal government, a direct benefit to workers, and it would only be a support for families, workers, and businesses, particularly small businesses. So, you know, I think there are some people who... Um, still want to talk about the role of government and spending. And I think these are all circular arguments that are just not resonating anymore. And this is something we can't afford not to invest in. Families lose over $20 billion a year in this country because of a lack of paid leave. And we know that if we passed it with some other related care policies, that it would actually yield millions of jobs, billions in wages, and trillions in GDP. So um, I frankly think there's no opposition left. Don, one of your partners, Amy Jo Hutchinson of Moms Rising, said recently, you aren't allowed to lift anything heavier than your newborn for six weeks after a C-section. You aren't allowed to drive, yet women are made to return to work so they can financially survive. For context, for our listeners, can you explain how this is not actually radically progressive <laughs> and where in the world... As, as Aaron sort of alluded to before, where in the world the U.S. ranks in taking care of its people? We talk about family values in this country. We talk about being there for the people we love. We talk about parenthood and family. And we don't have the policies, the simple common sense policies that enable you to do that. Um, so absolutely, you know, we say that women should breastfeed for six months. We say that women with a C-section shouldn't lift anything, shouldn't drive, shouldn't be able to get to work. And we live in a world now where pretty much everyone needs to be working, you know, needs to be in the formal economy. So this is just, we're behind, we're behind the curve. Um, we are one of, as Aaron said earlier, we are one of the only countries in the world, it's us in Papua New Guinea, who have no form of paid leave for its workers. And this was something we needed, as I said, years ago. But now we just, we cannot wait anymore. We can't afford the cost of inaction. Yeah, Alyssa and I were actually texting about this earlier before we talked to you. And I can't imagine how hard it would be for somebody that doesn't have a partner who can help them out after having a C-section. Like the idea of a person surviving as a single mother. Alyssa was saying that she helped a friend go to the doctor because it was right. so impossible. Um, I also have read that like it's not legal for dog breeders to separate dogs and puppies before eight weeks. And yet there is absolutely no law protecting new moms. I think it's just it's mind blowing to me. It's it's absolutely mind blowing. I mean, absolutely. I think it shows we have more appreciation and value of, of pets, animals than we do of, of people giving birth in this country. That's a whole other, you know, that could be I could go on for hours about that, but absolutely. And it's just atrocious. And I think um, this is something, as I said, it's been a crisis for so long. And my hope is that right now it's been so magnified during this pandemic and this crisis that people realize we have an opportunity to finally get this done and to catch up with the rest of the world, and we cannot miss the opportunity. So you're talking about right now being a prime opportunity um, to get this done. Um, I know it's like right now, we're, we're almost there. What can our listeners do right now to get involved and get this across the finish line? And um, do you think we'll succeed this time? I do think we'll succeed. I think we have, it's, uh, you know, all the stars are aligned. I, I wish they'd been aligned a long time ago, but I think this is the moment where I think there's a new understanding and appreciation of the urgency and the value of, of paid leave in this issue, how it touches every single one of us. Uh, I also think that we have, as I said, this you know historic commitment from the White House supporting Congress, unprecedented support, a chorus of supporters in the business community and beyond. 
And I think now we have a path through budget reconciliation. I think it's going to happen. And I think we need everyone else to get involved, though. So you can go to our website, paidleaforall.org. We have one button, click uh, Take Action. Within a few seconds, you can contact your members of Congress, your senators. You can call them. You should meet with them. Go to their town halls. Um, make sure that they're listening to your voice, that this is something that cannot wait. It is as important, as I said, if not more, than roads and bridges as we come out of this crisis and try to really recover and have long-term growth and make sure that we're taking care of people, particularly the people who have carried us through this pandemic. As I said, women, caregivers, low-wage workers, essential workers, people of color. This is something that if we protect each other, we should have learned it protects all of us. So yes, please um, make your voice heard. Follow us on Twitter, hashtag paid for all, all of those things and um, come along for the ride. Yeah, I mean, get on or or watch it drive away, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, Dawn, thank you so much for joining us uh, thank during you. this very crucial moment for paid leave. And uh, obviously, we're going to be keeping close tabs on this and, and really hope it goes our way. Thank you so much for having me. 